Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see You guys notice anything different about me today? I got a crown on. Do you know why I got a crown on? Because today I am king. I am. You know how I know I'm king? What? I got a crown on. So I get to be the king. Now, as the king, guess what I get to do? give people orders do things I want what not get arrested <laughs> Pat that was your girl I'm just saying okay yeah those 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 are good but as king I get to do something that affects all of you I get to make the rule I get, if I say I want all the girls on this side and all the boys on that side, that means you got to move. If I say all the candy belongs to me, guess what, Alyssa? You'll bite me. <laughs> she will not give her sucker up. And Now, if you were king, would you make any, any rules or laws? What would you do, Raylan? If you were king, what, what's one rule you'd make? All the candy goes to you. Because I've already seen you eat your sucker. She was a, what would you do, Gavin? What law would you make? All the ice cream. All right. What do you think about that, Walker? Would you make any laws? Would you make any laws? This one scares me. You what? A lot of snow cones. What would you do, Ashton? All the candy. <sighs> Cannon, sorry, Cannon, what would you do? Crew, do you have anything? Randy, I'm not even going with the other one. Okay, does anybody else have a law that you would make? You got one now, Gavin? All the fish. What do you got, Lisa? Can't do illegal things. Well, how do we know if it's illegal or not unless you make a law what's illegal? What would be something illegal? You can't steal other things. I'm sure that had nothing to do with me taking her sucker. Can't steal anything. Maybe you... What do you got? All the money. 
but I want see it's like you got all this power well Jesus had all this power because he was king and he gave us a law about what we should do and I and, and I love it because it's it's found in Mark Matthew and Luke and do you know what it's called the golden rule some people will say the golden rule is whoever has all the gold rules which I guess that'd be Keegan but it's really not listen to what he says about what the greatest law is that he gives he says I say to you who hear love your enemies do good to those who hate you bless those who curse you pray for those who use you to him who strikes you on one cheek offer him the other also he who takes away your cloak do not withhold your tunic either give to everyone who ask of you and from him who takes away your goods do not ask for them back and this is the golden rule just as you want men to do to you you also do to them basically it's saying however you want people to treat you treat them I love brothers they're picking at each other picking at each other and 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 do you like to be picked at no do you like to pick on your brother do you like to pick on your brother see when you do one the others gonna follow and we need to remember whatever we do to people it's gonna come back to us and Jesus is saying you know what be kind to everybody and they'll be kind to you so we need to understand that's the golden rule it goes like this in Matthew do unto others as you would have them do unto you let's pray father help us to teach these kids the value of the golden rule and not just to tell them but to model it in our own lives in your name we pray Jesus amen We'll sing one more, and then we're going to have a piano special. Uh, number 576 in uh, F. <laughs>
course, that means I got to give you something to keep it going by. Remember that old song, Give Me Gas in My Ford, Keep Me Trucking for the Lord? Except this isn't really Ford country, so I don't know that I better say that. Might backfire on me. Uh, Sue did announce that uh, Bible study had been changed because Mother Nature's being a heifer again. But I think for the last three or four weeks, we've had winter at least one day each week. And uh, weather is predicted to get rough on Wednesday. We will try and let you know by between noon and 3 on Wednesday what our, uh, whether we're having church or not. That's just the easiest way to put it. Um, so we'll, we'll be putting out on the prayer chain, uh, putting out on uh, probably a YouTube video or Facebook, something like that. We'll, we'll try and exhaust all our resources. If you have any, any questions, uh, give me a call. The deacons a call, and we'll let you know. But it's supposed to get icy, supposed to get cold, supposed to... I mean, it's almost normal now, isn't it? it it's like we come to, to expect it. And, um, well, it just is what it is, and we can't change that. The good news is it's three weeks till uh, time change, which means it's only another week till spring. Four weeks till spring, three weeks till time change, and two weeks from today, we will be celebrating our 90th anniversary. 90th anniversary. Uh, got a lot of stuff that's, that, that's planned. We'll be doing our regular morning service Sunday school and, and worship. By the way, turn to Mark, uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Uh, morning worship Sunday school will be the same. There will be a lunch after worship is over, time to fellowship. We have some folks that will be coming in from other churches. At 1 o'clock, uh, we will be starting our anniversary celebration. Next week, we will kind of put up an order of service that's there for you to see. Uh, and, and it'll go from about 1 to 3. We'll be taking a short break in between, but we have got special music. We've got testimony. You have one of your home-raised boys that's coming to preach, not this boy, uh, but one of your, your home-raised boys that will be here to bring a, a anniversary celebration sermon to you. Rodney Karch, is that right? We'll be preaching morning, or we'll be preaching anniversary message to you. Uh, it, it will be an exciting time. There'll be some tables set up with some memorabilia, pictures of the church in the past. If you have any pictures of the church through the last 90 years, please bring them up and share if you would write on the back of it or label it somehow your name and, and, and about the time era, what it's from. Uh, because a lot of people may not know. I, beyond the, this building, I'm not going to know much. But I have really enjoyed reading the minutes. And we will have an updated 90 years of history that will be available. Now, if you have someone you would like to invite by formal invitation, talk to Teresa. She has some invitations that we can you can send out to the individuals. Do you have all your testimonies, Teresa? If you would like to tell what Lee Choir Baptist Church has meant, done, shaped you, we would like to give you that opportunity. See, Teresa, she's already recruited a few, and she could probably recruit more. So if you see her coming, run. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm excited about that. I have only been able to... In, in, in the 36 years of ministry, I have had two anniversary celebrations and one where we celebrated uh, the Constitution uh, and, and incorporation and, and, and like that. So it, it's going to be an exciting, exciting time. A.W. Tozer, what a wonderful man. What? Business meeting has business meeting is supposed to be the 6th of March because of the anniversary celebration on the 6th of March and the fact many of you will be here from 9:30 till 3 we are moving the business meeting to the 7th or to the 13th 7 days later it will be Sunday night March 13th thank you Les March 13th 
So put that on your, on your calendars for the change. I didn't write it down, Jill. You'd think I'd learn. Folks, if you want an announcement of me to say it, you got to write it down. Or tell less. Yes. A.W. Tozer, man of prayer. Any book that you get on Tozer, you cannot go wrong. He made the comment, the missing jewel of the church is worship. He goes on to say, John MacArthur, in, in his book on actually pastoral ministry, I'm, I'm using this as a textbook with, with a fellow pastor as a mentorship, but, but MacArthur has said if Tozer were still with us today, he would probably reiterate that statement. Why? Because in America, there are... 350,000 churches that own 80 billion, not million, billion dollars worth of, worth 80 billion dollars um, worth of facilities that are dedicated to worshiping God. But the question must be asked, how much true worship really happens in those churches. So this week and next week, I'm going to do a remedial course on worship. Today, the wrong way. Next week, what we can do that's the right way or to make sure, let me put it this way, to make sure that we're doing it the right way. This book has come as a refresher to me to remind me of what it means to be a pastor. What it means to have pastoral duties. And when I was looking through the index, looking through the preface, looking through the chapters, what it's going to be. I saw this one on worshiping, and I thought, well, that's kind of a given. And then I read the chapter. And, and it has inspired me to share a couple of things with you for two Sundays. You know, much that transpires in our church today under the name of worship would probably be found unacceptable to God. Now, I want you to let that stick in your craw a minute because I'm sure there's many out there that are going, no, 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 no. But I want you to humor me before you pass judgment or shut me out. Let me take this day to show you the four places where we very possibly are not. And I think they may surprise you. MacArthur says further, Scripture has at least four categories of false worship. God has designed worship to be honor and adoration directed toward himself. It has outward, inward, and upward dimensions and touches every area of a Christian's life in doing good, sharing with others, and praising God. You see, I feel like what we have done, and I'm going to speak generically, not just, not Lee Choir. This is generically. I feel like what we have done is worship we give to God is that hour or hour and a half, one day a week, and we walk out that door and our worship has ended. And then in many of the larger churches where they have the multiple instruments on the stage, they have their praise team behind the leader, and they dim the lights, and we all stand for up to 30 minutes. And we look at these words that are on a screen, and some of them are the 7-11 service, 
Seven words and you repeat them 11 times. Very emotional driven. But they will come out and they will start. We're here to worship God. There will be something the band is playing. It may be upbeat. It may be contemporary. It may be traditional. It may, it may invoke that quietness within you to where you meditate upon where you're at. Or it may have you on your feet, tapping your toe, dancing, doing whatever. And they will say, we're going to start out with worship and we're going to worship God. And then the preacher's going to preach. That's false worship. It's false worship. Why do I say that? Because worship is the minute you walk in this door. Worship is fellowshipping with those that are around you, praying with those that are around you. Worship is the preparation of your heart through scriptural reading. Maybe, it, and a big part of it may be through the music that's there. Worship is the taking up of the offering. We give our sacrifice to God through the offering that's there. Worship is opening the word of God and breaking it open and the preaching of the word of God. I do not believe one of those elements that I just mentioned has any greater priority over one of the others. Worship is, is, is everything that's involved. You know, flour doesn't make bread. Sugar and milk and vanilla don't make a cinnamon roll. You have to take all of those ingredients and combine them together to come out with. And if you put more of one ingredient than is recommended, or that you, I think it needs a little more. I think it needs, and my luck, it never comes out like it's supposed to. That's worship. God has given us the elements of worship. And, and you know what? I, I think, Jill, I think back one of the best times of, of, of worship that, that, that we had prior to here was right before we came here. We, we were on the Outer Banks, and there was a church at Kitty Hawk, and we went in, and their music was, it was great music. They had some, some of the old hymns, some of the new hymns, and the pastor preached one of the most worshipful messages that I've heard. You'll never guess what it was on. You remember, Jill? Stewardship and tithing. And I thought, dude, I'm coming in to visit in the middle of, or the end of summer, and you want to bring a tithing message? You are brave. Oh, my gosh, it was so impactful because he took from Scripture what our obligations were to God as, as tithing in obedience and worship. And I went, wow. But Jill and I both said the same thing. You know what he did over and over? He apologized. I really don't want to. I really hate to do this. And I'm thinking, no, it's in God's word. How can you apologize for it? But it was tremendous. My point is this. Worship. Worship. What have we made it to be? Is it right or is it wrong? I think one of the best places to find worship is found in, in John's gospel with Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. Isn't that amazing? A Samaritan, not a, not a full-blood Jew, a Samaritan, and a Samaritan woman who was living in the act of adultery with, with four husbands, five husbands. The one she's with is not even her husband, the man she's with, and yet Jesus talks to her about worship. But I'm going to start before then and do the background to it. Okay, John chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord heard that the Pharisees, or when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but the disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. I call it noon o'clock. It's lunchtime. Lunchtime. They left 
Judea, left Jerusalem. The Pharisees got their tunic in a twist, and he, he needs to leave before things get really bad. So they're journeying on, and he has to go through Samaria. Remember, a good Jew would go north on the east side, go no, going north on the east side of the Jordan to miss going around Samaria and then go across east to west on the north side of Samaria. A journey that would go from 40 or 50 miles to 100 miles just to keep, and Jesus had to go through Samaria right in the midst of the people that had an animosity, a hatred with one another. So it's, it's noon, he's tired, and he sits down, and, and the men go in to find, his disciples go in to find some food. In verse 7, he said, a, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said, give me a drink. I'm going to stop there. The time to go to the well was not at noon. It's hot. It's dusty. And, and, and the time to go to the well is early in the morning when it's cooler and carry the water or late in the evening because of who this woman was, not being a, a Samaritan, but being a woman that had a questionable past. Rather than go through the ridicule, it was just easier to go to the well at noon. She goes there and Jesus said, give me a drink. Her response, verse 9, the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I wondered which surprised her more, that Jesus was in Samaria or that he talked to her, knowing she was a Samaritan, knowing that she was a woman. We can't answer that question, but she was very perplexed about this. Jesus said, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Kind of a conundrum to the woman. You know, what do you, what do you mean by this? And the woman said in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us a well and drank from this himself as well as his sons and livestock? So she questions Jesus, you know, why are you talking to me? You don't have anything to draw with. This well is deep. And what's this living water that you're talking about anyway? Jesus tells her in verse 13, Whoever drinks this water will thirst again. Talking about the, Jacob's well. But whoever drinks the water that I give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, figuratively speaking, this, this, this woman hears this, and she's getting past, okay, a Jew talking to me, getting past, uh, you don't have anything to draw with. And now Jesus is telling her, anybody that comes, drinks from this well is going to get thirsty again. But when I give you water, it will be a satisfying that you will never thirst again. You know, that is so much salvation. That is so much a, a, a positive experience, a time of worship when we can come together and we can experience God. Jesus never leaves you empty. He never leaves you thirsty. And here he is telling this woman, and by the way, these Samaritans had no way of salvation. They couldn't go to the temple in Jerusalem. They couldn't go to the feast. They made their own place of worship on a hill just outside of Samaria. Was there, here's where we're going to go worship, and they'll get into that one. But here Jesus is telling her, I got something for you. The woman says, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst or come here to drink. She's still thinking of the physical aspect of it. And Jesus said, call your husband. Boy, the word play here. We, we, we can spend all day and I'm not going to. I got to hurry through this. Said, Go get your husband. The woman says, I have no husband. And now he's the prophet and he tells her, you've said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom now you're living with is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. <laughs> can you imagine her eyes? Can you imagine what she thought? She, she knew that Jesus couldn't know her because he's not from the area, and she was not going to lie. And, and he tells her, hey, you know, you've said well. And it's like someone found out your sin and tells you about it when no one knows. I think it had to be one of those what kind of moments. Where did that come from? And, 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 and the woman says, sir, 
I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain. Now, they've already gone from a Jew to a Samaritan. Then they went from the water that's there to the water Jesus offers. And now she's going to move into the worship aspect of it. She said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our, our fathers worship on this mountain. And you Jews in Jerusalem, wanting to place their worship at the different places, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming, and now, now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, you know, I know Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus identifies, I who speak to you am him. Going into a place of worship. And here's, I think, I think here's where we as a church have missed it. Because we come here and we worship. And we like it. You got almost 60 people here again. Our number, isn't that awesome? But, and, and it's good to hear the singing. It's good. But when we leave, we shut the doors and our worship is over till we come back next Sunday. And here's the cool thing. Jesus is having a moment of worship with this woman right where she's at. Right where she's at. And Jesus expects us to do the same. Jesus expects us to worship when we're putting hay out. Jesus expects us to worship when we're breaking the ice. Jesus expects us to worship when we're cleaning house. Jesus expects us to worship when we're running the family taxi back and forth from school, from ball games, from where. Jesus expects us to worship when we are together as a family or when we're individual. Jesus expects us to worship when we open that word of God in the morning or at the end of the day and have that reading, have that devotional. Jesus expects us to worship when we're at Walmart waiting in the self-checkout line because these checkers that are checking out themselves are too stinking slow. They don't know what they're doing. Or they've got a $300 order. I hate to say it, but I'm getting to be one of them older folk that i got to sit here and scratch my head on what to do next. I don't like it, but we're supposed to worship. We are supposed to worship, and Jesus tells her, the day is coming, and now is that day. Worship in spirit and in truth. That's what I want our, our central scripture to be. I've taken 20 minutes to get to that central scripture that we're going to use the next two weeks. But here's, we need to worship in spirit and in truth. But you know, when the word worship is mentioned, for, for some people, it, it invokes images of holy hardware, sacred rites, robes, collars, censers, water, cups, silence, incense, all of those things. We see beads, prayer wheels, sacred art, and, and those things seem essential to some in the worship experience. In some systems, it's the place of worship that is paramount. But worship has come to mean ritual. Three songs, offering, special music. We'll have, a, we'll have a prayer, we'll have a sermon, and we'll have another prayer, and we'll go home. Hocus, pocus, Grandma Locust, we've been to worship. No, you've been to church. See, you can go to church and not worship. I can go at the grocery store and not buy anything. I can go to the Ford lot and look at vehicles, although not very many of them, and, and, and not buy a thing. See, I can do a lot of things, but am I really doing anything? We can go to church and we can go through 
the acts, but that's the problem. It's an act. It's an act. Even in some Christian traditions, candles, insult, uh, incense, holy vestments, lit liturgy have come become virtually synonymous. If we read these scriptures, if we quote this prayer, well, then that was worship. And you know, it can be. But it has to be in what spirit and truth. The number of people. Well, let, let me. The, these elements that, that I, I, I've mentioned, they have lulled evangelicals into careless thinking about what worship is. Over the past decade or so, there's been all kinds of books that are written about worship. Songs that are said, sing these and it will bring you to worship. Some of these contain excellent material, but many of them fall into the trap of equating worship with this word that's called liturgy. Pre-rehearsed, pre laid out for you, and this is what... Now, you can't accuse very many Baptist church of this. Because let's be honest, in many ways, we kind of free you willy-nilly here. If we want to change the order of worship, we can change it, can't we, Jerry? You just did this morning. Going to sing one more song, we're going to have a special. I didn't know Kayla was going to play. I'm sure glad she did. This is awesome. We, we, we don't have a scripted prayer. We don't have a scripted prayer that we're going to say together. Quite often, it's just formal. Otherwise, one otherwise very fine book on worship repeatedly stated that evangelical worship is not as rich. I love this. Evangelical worship is not as rich as an Anglican, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox tradition. One man was quoted as saying, I go to the Baptist church to get fed the word of God, but I go to the fill-in-the-blank church where I can worship. Hmm. We missed it. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither this mountain, in this mountain or on Jerusalem, shall you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is when the worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In other words, the location or the external forms of worship that really matter are not what really matter. The attitude of the worshiper is what matters. Can I tell you why this was an act of worship? Jesus had that woman's attention. Jesus had a theological debate with that woman. And Jesus led that woman to a living water so much to the point that what did she do? She left and went and told everybody in town. So when we look at worship, there's, there's actually two different ways that we can, we can look at worship. Worship as it's designated to be next week, or what, what MacArthur calls deviant worship. Deviant. Now, I do not mean deviant in a, a negative sense. Deviant as in alternative taking away from and not that solid part of it. Scripture is very clear about this. Approximately one half of everything the Bible says about worship, you will find it condemns false worship. The first two of the Ten Commandments are prohibitions against false worship. Exodus 20, 
verses 2 through 5 says, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or likeness of what is in heaven uh, above or on the earth beneath it. In the water under the sea, you shall not worship them. For <coughs> for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Stop and think a minute. Consider how much of the Old Testament describes the evil consequences of false worship. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Abel brought the vegetables. No, Abel brought the livestock. Cain brought the vegetables. Abel's offering was accepted. Cain's was not. What happened? Cain killed Abel. You see the same thing in our world today. If we get rid of what's real, then all that's left is here, and I can't be judged. So what we see today is nothing new. We look also at, at the Israelites' golden calf at Sinai. They tried to make it something to worship when it was an object. God said, don't do that. How about Nadab and Abihu? I know those are crazy names, but they're real names. Those were Aaron's sons who came in and all they did was bring in a fire and an incense when they were not supposed to, and God struck them dead. What about King Saul's intrusion into the priesthood? King Saul was, yeah, when, when they were fighting the Amalekites, Samuel delayed in coming. You'll get to that one, Sue. Samuel delayed in coming, and the men were hiding and leaving and abandoning, and, and Saul said, if I don't have this offering, I'm going to have no one to fight the Amalekites. So he usurped the authority, and he slayed the sacrifice. And immediately when he did it, guess who showed up? And we saw it cost him dearly. Eli's wicked sons pilfered what was offered to God. Eli's sons took, and they did not wait for the meat to to be boiled did not they went and took what they want and they also profaned the priesthood by having sex with women outside of the temple doors and I'm still not done what about Elijah's confrontation with evil Jezebel he had a confrontation with her priest didn't they 850 400 of Baal 450 Astora, and, 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 and that didn't end well for them. Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, and, and, and the variations go on of these themes. Uzziah usurped the priesthood when he entered into the part of the, of the temple to give an offering that the king was not supposed to because of So I want you, what I want you to see is, is all of these that happened were acts of worship, and they ended well, did not end well. All self-styled, apparent worship is utterly unacceptable to God. And we need to take great care of what we do in this building and what we do outside of this building. Let me share with you something to think about how often these things are reiterated in the Old Testament. The things I just read. Exodus 20. Verses 4 through 6. I know, Exodus, the Ten Commandments. What's he say? You shall not make for yourself an idol or any image of what is in heaven above, on earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am jealous, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generation who hate me, but showing love and kindness to thousands who love me. How about verse chapter 34, verses 12 through 15? Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land which you are going, lest, you become a, lest they become a snare in your midst, but rather you are to tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherim, for you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord God, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play a harlot with their you play a harlot 
with their gods, sacrifice to their gods, someone invites you to eat his sacrifice. Deuteronomy 6.13, you will fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods or any of the gods of the people surrounding you. I want you to see what he's saying here is don't get caught up in the culture you're living in. You are to be a light. You are to lead them away, and you're to destroy every evidence about it because it will become a snare. When you look at our society today and what we have given way to, we have let our guard down. We have allowed them to be in our society, and it has become a snare to the future generations that we live in, that are living with us. We caved. We capitulated. We allowed, and we are chasing after. What was the downfall of the northern and southern kingdom? They worshiped false gods. They were not obedient, as God told Moses, as Joshua told them when God told him, go and slay them all, and they did not do it. And it cost them 70 years. You know the crazy thing is, after they came back from their 70 years of bondage, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom reunited back, they have never gone back to idolatry. Deuteronomy 8, 19 says, It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify to you today that you shall surely perish. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen and 17, Beware lest your hearts be deceived. You turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and will shut up the heavens so there will be no rain. The ground will not yield fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land. Beware you are not ensnared to follow the nations after you after they destroy you before after they are destroyed before you and that you do not inquire after God saying how do these nations serve their God whatever i command you you shall be careful to do you know it goes on and on and on and when we look at those scriptures the one thing you see is false gods scripture outlines at least four categories that are unacceptable places of worship or unacceptable worship false gods worship of true god in wrong form worship of the true god in self-styled manner and worship of the true god with a wrong attitude you know this first one worship of false gods i don't think we're going to struggle with it the lure of false gods seems irresistible to those who turn away from the true god but we don't we know who Jehovah God is, and we say, yes, we are going to worship. Romans 1.21 really, I think, says it the best because it indicts the human race for this very sin. Even though they knew God, the apostle wrote, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They knew God. But I am more concerned about. Now, may step on some toes. Pick your feet up. But we have those gods. We have gods of sports. Maybe our kids, our grandkids, maybe we do. Broke my heart last week to see the number of churches that had Super Bowl parties rather than worship. Oh, we did a short devotional. I'm old-fashioned. What can I say? Maybe it's the tractors. Don't understand that. Maybe it's the feed trucks. Maybe it's the cars. Maybe it's the homes. Maybe we have made the kids, the grandkids, our shrines. Maybe we have let God be our money, or money be our God. Maybe we've let our 401ks. Maybe we have let our stocks. Maybe we have let all these other things that have come in. Oh, I still believe in God. But where is your life being lived? You know, there is a thing that is called in our, 
in our Christian life, bibliolatry. What is bibliolatry, bibliolatry? What is that? Worshiping the Bible instead of God. Can that happen? Sure. Look at the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Sadducees to them, there was only five books and that was it. And we have to give great, great attention that we don't. You know, he goes on in Romans and says, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. It's unacceptable. Verse 24 tells the consequences of worshiping those false gods. God gave them over to the lust of their their hearts. Verse 26 says God gave them over to degrading passions. Verse 28 says God gave them over to a depraved mind. The results of an improper worship was that God simply gave them over to the sin and their consequences. Whatever your God has become, that is what he'll give you over to. That's what he gives you over to. And we have to be so careful. Job chapter 31, verse 24 to, to 28 says, If I have put my confidence in gold and called gold my trust, if I have gloated because of my wealth was great, and if because my hand has secured so much, if I have looked at the sun when it was shown or the moon when it is going in splendor and my heart becomes secretly enticed, my hand threw a kiss from my mouth, that too would have been an iniquity calling for judgment, for I would have denied God above. Job. That righteous man who refused to worship the material. We have to give great care that we don't. Habakkuk 1, 15 and 16, say, it, it describes false worship of the Chaldeans. They bring, the Chaldeans bring all of them, the righteous, up with a hook, drab them into their net, gather them together in a fishing net. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they offer sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net. Their net was their military might, and the God they worshipped was armed with power that was a false god. Even today, people formulate supernatural gods, supposed deities. The rise of the New Age has produced a revival of pagan religions. We have more religions in our country today, and Christianity is pushed aside while the others are being recognized. And we want to say, well, we want to love everybody and include everybody. And I do. I want to include them to hear the truth. Jesus included the Samaritan woman who was an adulterer, a fornicator. He included her for salvation. And we need to include, but we do not need to sacrifice what God's word says. There is but one God, and he will not be mocked. He will not play a second place or allow any other to be with him. You know, Pastor, you're being very narrow-minded. You're being very cold. Who are you to condemn anybody? I am nobody to condemn, but I will tell you what God's word says unapologetically. You will worship him here on earth and you will worship him in heaven because Philippians says at the name of Jesus every knee will bow every tongue will confess they will not confess Allah they will not confess Buddha they will not confess Hare Krishna they will not confess Joseph Smith they will not confess any of these others they will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. I want people to hear the truth. We will worship God. We will not substitute anything for God. And when we stand before God, it will be in truth. Somebody said in the Bible, what is truth? <laughs> Jesus told Pilate what is truth truth's what you're looking at. No, not me. He was looking at Jesus. That's truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus 
tells us there is no under no other name under heaven by which men may be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. We cannot allow. We cannot. And you know, today we want to go and we want we want to see people and and they want to they want to say, you know, uh, well, I'm glad that you believe that, but that's okay for you, not for me. And I'm going to be honest with you as a believer. Don't say that. Why not? You know, you know what I believe, and it grieves me that you believe differently. Folks, you can base your belief on this word that has been around for millennia. And it will continue to be around. It has been, it has, they have tried to stifle it for years upon years upon years, and it has not happened, nor will it happen. We will not worship any other God than that. And my invitation to you is to take a moment and to look into your life and see, has something crept in? Is there something in your life that's keeping you from worshiping God 100% in spirit and truth? What a time to have an open altar for you to come down and to say, God, I give this over to you. Take it from me. And let me just say in closing, you let something be your God and you tell God to take it, he will. You may need to get rid of it because if it's keeping you from him, he can remove it. Let's stand. What number, Jerry? Page 307. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for reminding us about how easily things can creep in. And we can worship them. I pray that we may all look in our lives right now. And if there's one,